Let me begin. I'm Tom Robertson. It's a pleasure to see you all. Um, and I have uh, the pleasure uh, this afternoon of uh, introducing a very special speaker, um, uh, Neil uh, Wolin, uh, who is Deputy Secretary of the United States Department of the Treasury. Um, in the wake of the financial crisis, I think we all know financial reform has become a subject of considerable public debate. And at Penn and at Wharton, we've been really quite involved with this in, in terms of faculty expertise, which we've lent out to uh, various agencies. And we've also had uh, new courses which address the current landscape, or actually the evolving landscape. We began running courses a couple of years ago after the, the collapse of Lehman. And we think we have a reasonable ability and a deep obligation to immerse ourselves in uh, the important uh, considerations and conversations uh, underlying uh, financial reform. So when the Treasury Department called, um, I think just a few days ago actually, um, and indicated that Deputy uh, Secretary Wolin would be in town, would be in Philadelphia, uh, we jumped on the opportunity to have him here, uh, particularly in the heels of the historic Dodd-Frank uh, Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. Uh, that President Obama signed into law last month. It's a real pleasure to be here in Philadelphia and in particular here at the Wharton School. Two years ago, we witnessed a financial panic of a scale and a severity not seen since the Great Depression. Even as families and businesses across the country continue to struggle with the fallout of that crisis, it is easy to forget how close we came to a truly catastrophic financial collapse. The failures that led to this crisis were many. Throughout the financial system, firms took on risks that they did not fully understand. In Washington, regulators did not make full use of authority they had to protect consumers and limit excessive risk. Legislative loopholes allowed large parts of the financial industry to operate without oversight, transparency, or restraint. Policymakers were too slow to fix a broken system. And there is no doubt that across the country, many Americans took on more debt than they could afford, and that many, many firms encouraged them to do just that. So we all share responsibility for the crisis, and we all share responsibility for reform. Last month, when President Obama signed into law a comprehensive financial reform bill, the most significant financial reform since the 1930s, we took a tremendous step forward in meeting that responsibility. The reforms that are now the law of the land will help us rebuild a stronger, safer financial system, a system that is pro-growth and pro-investment, a system that does what it ought to do, help businesses finance growth, and help Americans save for retirement and borrow to finance an education or a home without fear of deception or abuse. A system that does these things without letting risks build up unseen and unmanaged. A system that is far less prone to panic and to collapse. A lot has been said about the financial reform law, so I want first to step back and look in broad strokes at what the new law accomplishes. First, these reforms give us the tools to look beyond the safety of individual firms or markets to the health of the broader financial system. Through the Financial Stability Oversight Council, supported by the Office of Financial Research, regulators will have the ability and the responsibility to identify and manage systemic risk. And the Federal Reserve will have examination and enforcement authority over all bank holding companies, as well as any non-bank financial companies designated by the council, so that the largest, most complex financial institutions will be subject to consolidated oversight, regardless of their corporate form. Second, these reforms require regulators to impose stronger prudential standards, robust risk-based capital, leverage, and liquidity standards to guard against both firm-specific failures and systemic shocks. Third, the reforms establish a comprehensive regulatory framework for the derivatives markets, the source of so much risk and uncertainty in the recent crisis. And at the same time, through a narrowly tailored end user exemption, the reforms ensure that commercial firms will be able to hedge their risks 
effectively and efficiently. Fourth, the reforms put an end to the problem of too big to fail. They give the government the authority to shut down and break apart large non-bank financial firms whose failure threatens the broader system. No firm can be insulated from the consequences of its actions. No firm can be protected from failure. No firm will benefit from the perception that taxpayers will be there to break their fall. The new law makes absolutely clear that taxpayers will never be asked to bear the costs of a financial firm's failure. Finally, the reforms address the fundamental failure of consumer protection that plagued our system in the years leading up to the crisis. The Bureau of Consumer Financial Protection, an independent entity within the Federal Reserve, will have one mission, to promote transparency and consumer choice and to prevent abusive and deceptive practices. Now, the law does much more, but these are the core elements, a focus on systemic risk, heightened prudential standards, comprehensive regulation of derivatives, an end to too big to fail, and robust consumer protection. Flaws in each of these areas helped precipitate or prolong the crisis, and this bill targets those flaws and fixes them. Enactment of the legislation is, of course, not the end of the financial reform effort. Now we must turn to the important work of implementation. Those of us in government, policymakers, regulators, supervisors, must make sure that these reforms meet the promise of the law, that these reforms provide both the necessary protections against financial excess and the benefits of financial innovation. We have already begun a rigorous implementation process. The work cannot be done overnight. It will take time. Each of the agencies involved in implementing financial reform, the Treasury, the Federal Reserve, the SEC, the CFTC, the OCC, the FDIC, and others, are in the process of outlining how they propose to prioritize rules they now have to write and setting initial dates for when the public will be able to comment on draft rules. Our work involves writing new rules in some of the most complex areas of modern finance. It involves consolidating authority now spread across multiple agencies. It involves setting up new institutions for coordination, crisis management, consumer protection, and for identifying systemic risks. It involves negotiations with countries around the world. Now, without getting ahead of that process, let me provide you with a brief introduction to the steps we expect to take in four of the most important areas over the next several months. First, consumer protection. Strengthening consumer protection doesn't mean more regulation, it means better regulation. To help consumers get the information they need to make the choices that are right for them. We will move quickly to give consumers simpler disclosures for credit cards, auto loans, and mortgages so that they can make better choices, borrow more responsibly, and compare costs. For example, in place of the two separate, inconsistent, and overly complicated federal mortgage disclosure forms that borrowers receive today, there should be one clear, simple, user-friendly form. We intend to move quickly to make that happen, and we will seek and test the best ideas from consumers, mortgage companies, and experts alike. In addition, we will be inviting public comment on new national underwriting standards for mortgages, so that we can begin to shape the reforms of the mortgage market. And we are working quickly to get the CFPB up and running to consolidate rulemaking and enforcement responsibilities that today are split inefficiently and ineffectively among seven different regulatory agencies. Second, we are moving, toward ref we are moving forward on reforming the GSEs and our broader housing finance system. In the next few weeks, the Treasury Department will host leading academics, consumer and community organizations, industry participants, and other stakeholders for a conference on the future of housing finance. We'll use that conference to seek input from across the political and ideological spectrum. And early next year, we will put forward our plan for reform. Third, we are going to move quickly to implement the reforms of the derivatives markets. We will work with the Fed, the SEC and the CFTC to outline specific quantitative targets 
from moving standardized derivatives trades onto central clearinghouses. And we will accelerate the international effort to put in place consistent global standards for these critical markets. Fourth, we are working quickly to establish new rules on capital to constrain excessive risk taking and leverage in the largest global financial institutions. Financial firms will have to hold more higher quality capital than they did before the crisis. Firms will be required to hold more capital against the types of risky trading related assets and obligations that caused so much financial damage during the crisis. Bigger firms and more complex interconnected firms will have to hold relatively more capital than smaller firms. New capital requirements will be supplemented with new global standards for liquidity management so that firms can withstand a severe shock in liquidity without deepening the crisis by selling assets in a panic or cutting credit lines indiscriminately. Getting this right is essential. We know that capital requirements must be raised, but we also know that if we set them too high too fast, we could hurt economic recovery or simply end up pushing risk outside of the regulated financial system. So we will move quickly, but we will move carefully. There will be a reasonable transition period with three years to meet the new minimum requirements and an additional period to build up buffers beyond those minimums. And it is important to note that because of the rigorous bank stress tests we conducted in 2009, the US financial system is in a very strong position internationally to adapt to these new rules. Those are the areas where we, the Treasury, regulators, will be focused in the coming months. We are committed to moving with speed, with transparency, and with a commitment to ensuring that our financial system remains the most competitive financial system in the world. But, I said, but as I said at the start, reform is a shared responsibility. And so to those in the financial industry, I encourage you not to wait on Washington before embracing change. As we work together to rebuild our financial system, responsible private sector leadership is every bit as important as responsible regulation and supervision. Now before I close, let me just say this. As with any issue of public policy as significant and consequential as financial reform, there are bound to be differences of opinion. But I think no one who witnessed the events of the past two years can deny that these reforms are necessary and long, long overdue. No doubt, some people will continue to claim as they have over the past year that these reforms will bring about the end of American enterprise. So let me offer some perspective. Four years after the great crash of 1929, still in the depths of a Great Depression, another generation rose to meet the great challenge of their day by establishing bold new bank protections and new securities laws. At the time, just as now, the opponents of reform predicted grave danger. In 1933, Time Magazine wrote in reference to the bill that created the FDIC, and I quote, through the great banking houses of Manhattan last week ran wild-eyed alarm. Big bankers stared at one another in anger and astonishment. A bill just passed would rivet upon their institutions what they considered a monstrous system. Such a system, they felt, would not only rob them of their pride of profession, but would reduce all US banking to its lowest level. And a year later, in 1934, the president of the US Chamber of Commerce, speaking of the Securities Exchange Act, said, and I quote again, it is the opinion not only of stock exchange brokers, but of thoughtful businessmen that its sweeping and drastic provisions would seriously affect the legitimate business of all members of stock exchanges and investment banks with the resultant disastrous consequences to the stock market, would greatly prejudice the interests of all investors, would tend to destroy the liquidity of banks, and would impose on corporations of the country serious handicaps in the practical operation of their business. We all know how wrong those warnings were. Far from weakening American firms, destroying the liquidity of American banks, and handicapping the operation of business. The creation of the FDIC and the 34 Act, along with the 33 Act, 
helped lay the foundations for the most stable, <clears throat> most competitive, most innovative, most transparent, and most trusted financial system in the world. Like the banking and securities laws of the 1930s, the Dodd-Frank Act lays the foundation for a stronger, safer financial system. Innovative, creative, competitive, globally leading, and far more stable than the one we have today. These reforms will benefit American business and the American people by providing a more stable source of financing for the investments and innovations that will drive economic growth in the years ahead. Across America, millions of Americans still feel the pain of economic downturn. But we are on the road to recovery. We are repairing the damage caused by the crisis. And by implementing financial reform, we are taking the hard but necessary steps to ensure that our financial system leads the world in this century just as it did in the last. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I have a question about too big to fail. Uh, if we do not limit the size of financial institutions and we have a failure, even though the federal government can unwind that firm, there would, by definition, be large losses. So who absorbs those losses if they're massive? And if not the US taxpayer, who? Great question. So first of all, there are in this legislation, I think, um, a range of uh, things that um, either create size constraints or positive incentives not to grow beyond a certain size. So as I said in my talk, uh, higher capital requirements if you're bigger and if you're more interconnected. Um, the legislation adds a kind of a modern day uh, version of the deposit cap that currently applies to banks that looks at uh, total assets on a risk-weighted basis so that um, you know, uh, the, the problem with the current deposit cap is that it uh, in a sense, caps the safest kind of assets and, and, um, uh, and then sends people to go elsewhere if they want to grow. Um, and a range of things that fundamentally are um, uh, risk constraining. But I think the, the question, nonetheless, obviously valid. Um, the way the legislation works is that modeled on the fiducia, current fiducia authorities that exist for the government with respect to banks, that bank holding companies or non-bank financial institutions um, that are of a certain size can, uh, if they become insolvent, will be broken up, um, uh, be done so in a way that is uh, designed to insulate the broader financial system from the kind of contagion effect that was so prevalent in this last round of crisis. Uh, this is meant to be paid for in the first instance from the assets of the firm that is being broken up. But insofar as the predicate is insolvency, um, the whatever increment, um, and, and oh, by the way, I mean, I, I haven't gone through it, but the whole point of having higher capital standards and, and leverage constraints and so forth and so on is to minimize the chance of this happening. But in the case uh, uh, that you suggest, um, to the extent that the estate of the firm that's being broken up is insufficient to pay the costs, then financial firms uh, will be levied for that cost, not the taxpayer. The statute very explicit on this question, uh, the FDIC will levy a charge basically ex post uh, on financial firms, big financial firms, uh, who uh, in, the, in our judgment and in the judgment of the Congress after all would be the principal beneficiaries of um, the notion that the contagion effect will be dampened by this new process and that the financial system um, will be uh, well protected. So. Uh, First recourse is to uh, the firm and its, you know, its capital stack, um, its, its common equity holders, uh, and so forth. Um, uh, and beyond that, uh, financial firms. Thank you. Uh, there has been a lot of effort to, um, to create a more stable situation in the financial system, these regulations among them, and, and to help um, put Wall Street on a firmer footing. But Main Street is still suffering a lot. And just today, there was an announcement that weekly initial unemployment claims uh, increased to almost 480,000. And that means that the four-week moving average has 
basically been stuck for about eight months now. So what more could be done for unemployment more immediately than just waiting for a recovery to come, which many people think is going to be very slow in coming? So there's no question there is, as I suggested in my talk, still an enormous amount of pain uh, across America felt by individuals and families and small businesses, uh, the result of a very, very deep recession that we um, faced in 2008 and the beginning of 2009. Um, uh, I think there are now uh, increasingly um, uh, signs of a moderate recovery that is beginning to build. We have had now four quarters in a row of growth, six months in a row of job growth. Um, there is still a lot more work to be done. Uh, and so uh, the President, uh, the Secretary of the Treasury, the administration generally very focused on making sure that the government uh, provides the appropriate basis for stimulus while understanding that ultimately it's for the private sector really to uh, generate uh, jobs as it has done in the United States. Uh, we're focused on creating the conditions for that to happen and for that to happen at a rate that continues and ticks upward. Um, so uh, Congress is considering an additional stimulus package. The Senate acted on it last night. The House is going to come back in session briefly next Tuesday to act on it. That's an important piece. There is pending in Congress small business legislation that would provide uh, incentives for small banks to extend credit to small businesses, a set of tax cuts that are targeted at small businesses that are really focused on job creation and economic growth. We think that that's important legislation. It has the support not only of the president, but of the Chamber of Commerce and of uh, the small business community. Uh, we think that's an important uh, uh, piece. Um, and so uh, we believe that we are on a trajectory that is positive. As you note, the, the data that comes in is not, uh, is not even. So although we've added jobs each of the last six months, uh, the week-to-week -week data and sometimes the month-to-month -month, uh, data has a certain amount of unevenness to it. And we, it, what it reminds us is we have substantial more work to, to do. I think if you look at where we are today, relative to where we were a year ago or 18 months ago, uh, um, we feel like we've made uh, very, very important improvements really on the basis of some um, really uh, decisive stands that the President took and that the Congress uh, took with respect to uh, fiscal stimulus, with respect to efforts to repair the financial system, and now uh, legislation that both reforms the health care system and the financial services uh, framework. Uh, and we will keep on this path, um, uh, looking at ways to um, create uh, uh, jobs through near-term stimulus, so that's what the legislation that's about to pass the Congress will do, uh, looking for ways to create additional incentives for the private sector uh, to, to grow. I would note that if you look at the uh, GDP numbers that uh, were released last week, um, they suggest, I think, an important um, increase in the level of business investment and of private sector consumption uh, that um, are, I think, further signs that this recovery is starting to take hold and to build. Um, and uh, these other efforts that I've identified are meant to uh, continue that along, uh, to um, help transfer the, um, the job creation to the private sector, which is uh, where it ought to happen and should happen, and to do so in a way that is um, also responsible and credible within a broader fiscal context uh, that our country has over the, um, over the longer, the intermediate and longer term. We have one question from Margaret Wharton from Rachel Tipp. Hi. Um, public policy seems to focus a lot on startups and small businesses since those are regarded as engines of job creation. Um, but in the US alone, middle market companies account for about $6 trillion in revenues and 32 million employees. I mean, what has been your policy so far to provide incentives in that sector? And what steps do you plan to take in the future to strengthen it further? Well, I think if you look at the um, administration's efforts 
partly related to the Recovery Act uh, fiscal piece, partly related to um, the tax um, uh, initiatives of the administration, there's a lot of focus on um, uh, investment in healthcare, in green energy, in a range of things that span sort of uh, businesses, small, medium-sized, bigger businesses. So the focus on small businesses by no means meant to be exclusive of focus on finding ways to generate growth and job creation across the range of um, businesses by size or by geography or for that matter by sector. And I think you'll continue to see um, a set of um, tax policies that are focused on um, trying to uh, generate research and development and um, technological innovation uh, that both uh, create near-term growth, but also, uh, and importantly, are focused on things that are important to the longer-term health of our economy and of our country uh, in, in other sorts of ways. So whether it's energy or healthcare, education, uh, so forth. Could you elaborate what the Dodd-Frank Act and the subsequent regulatory authority are doing with respect to reducing or eliminating conflict of interest within the financial system? Well, I think there, is a, there are a range of elements of the legislation just enacted that have to do with transparency. So um, uh, transparency to consumers, uh, transparency in the ways that credit rating agencies um, conduct their affairs, uh, transparency with respect to uh, how the securitization markets are organized and, um, uh, and um, express what it is they're doing, uh, uh, transparency in corporate governance. Um, and all of these, I think, have uh, a link to one or another form of either conflict of interest or potential conflict of interest so that for example, the legislation um, precludes uh, firms incenting their, their sales employees from, in the mortgage space, for example, from uh, uh, trying to um, uh, entice customers to uh, buy uh, uh, mortgage products that are more costly. Um, uh, it uh, uh, makes sure that credit rating agencies are precluded from, on the one hand, rating a firm's products and on the other hand, having a set of consultancy arrangements that uh, generate fee income. Um, so there's a range of, of these sorts of things which I think um, individually are important in the aggregate quite um, central to um, making sure that, um, that you know, regulators understand what's going on, that firms have incentives that are uh, appropriately aligned with uh, concepts of risk and risk management uh, so that, um, uh, that, you know, in all of those ways um, uh, there's a greater focus on, on risk or, or on the, on the uh, constraint of it. So those are just examples. Good afternoon. I wanted to know if you could talk about the, cons <coughs> the Consumer Protection Agency. Like, let's say I were to explain to my friend's grandma what that will do and like how that would mitigate um, the effects of, let's say, a future financial crisis for somebody like that, um, if you can talk a bit about that. Sure. I mean, I think uh, it is our core conviction. I think it's uh, demonstrably the case that a core element of what got us into um, uh, the crisis in which we found ourselves was a set of failures related to consumer protection in the credit space. People taking on, um, uh, on uh, liabilities and debt that they didn't understand, that uh, they couldn't um, uh, cope with, uh, f uh, for which they didn't understand features or pricing or the basic options that were available to them. And this was a hugely important contributor to the overall uh, buildup of, um, uh, of, pr of trouble. The, um, so I would say the Consumer Bureau that this legislation creates does a couple things. First of all, it creates an entity that really is focused on these issues. Uh, to this point, these issues have been uh, 
parts of other regulatory agencies whose principal uh, focus and whose principal responsibilities have been on things like safety and soundness and market protection and so forth, which are enormously important. So no intent to sort of minimize the importance of that, but uh, have more or less been the core set of things on which those entities have been, um, have been working. And now, I think, uh, for the first time, uh, an entity with a set of statutory um, uh, authorities and, and, and capabilities to make sure uh, across the consumer credit space, whether it's uh, mortgages or credit cards or student loans um, <clears throat> or what have you, make sure that, as I said in my talk, that consumers have a keen understanding of what it is they're being offered, what choices they have available to them, what the consequences of making this choice or that choice uh, is and, uh, or might be. And our conviction is that uh, um, hugely important for people to have that understanding, to be able to exercise their judgment, to be able to uh, manage their affairs, uh, and to have this entity also be able to make some judgments about practices that, um, uh, that are unfair, that are abusive, that have contributed to some of this uh, mess in the first place. Uh, Congress last year um, enacted the CARD Act, which was focused on a set of rules uh, around consumer protection in the credit card space, something that the President was very much focused on, uh, an important initiative of his and of the administration's. And, um, this legislation now will create uh, the capacity for the government to uh, make sure that the marketplace pays attention to those things, that the rules that uh, implement that legislation, as just one example, are strong. And I would add, importantly, that consumer protection in the financial space at the federal level has overwhelmingly been focused on banks. And this legislation gives this new Consumer Protection Bureau authority to write rules and supervise and enforce consumer protection, not just on banks, but also on non-banks, on mortgage companies, on payday lenders, um, uh, on student loan providers, and so forth. And so I think in all those ways, this is going to make uh, a big difference in an area that was right at the core of, among many, uh, you know, it was multifactorial, but at the core of what went wrong in this financial system crisis. Uh, thank you so much for being here. My question has to do more with the large corporations. Um, and the Federal Reserve recently reported uh, that Americans' 500 largest non-financial firms have accumulated something like $1.8 trillion in cash. So by any calculation, as a percentage of assets, that's basically the highest that it's been in almost half a century. And I just wanted to get your candid feedback as to what out-of-the-box thinking you guys are doing to move those dollars to be reinvested into the workforce um, plans and, and uh, you know, things that could really uh, make a difference that might have more staying power than a government stimulus would. Sure. Excellent question. I mean, I think I'd note in uh, sort of at the threshold that... Um, that this is a high-class problem, meaning um, what, it what the data that the Fed um, uh, produced suggests is that the balance sheets of corporate America are in an awfully strong place at the moment. And um, you know, a year on or 18 months on from the distress that we went through, one might not have uh, predicted that. And so I think the first, you know, the first observation I'd have is that's a good thing. Um, uh, the second is that. Um, Again, if you look at the data, the most recent um, GDP data, uh, you're starting to see now, I think, a meaningful uptick in the extent to which businesses are starting to invest in, um, in uh, fixed property and uh, IT, uh, other sorts of things that are suggestive of, uh, of good things to come. Uh, you know, the economy just went through an enormous amount of stress. It's still unwinding from that stress. The financial system has delevered in an enormous way. Uh, and so um, it didn't take us, uh, it, it took us quite a while to get ourselves into this set of circumstances. It's going to take a little while to work our way through it. I think, as I said earlier, we are starting to feel the signs of recovery and movement toward uh, 
um, to job growth and to business investment uh, in ways that um, uh, are, are positive. Uh, but it will, it will take a little while to work its way through. Um, I think there, as I said earlier, continues to be a role for the government to play in helping um, stimulate some of that uh, private sector activity, uh, priming it in a range of ways, both on the fiscal, uh, both on the spending side and on the tax side, uh, and that is what we will continue to do. The American taxpayer owns 80 percent of Fannie and Freddie, and we've lost 145 billion so far with projections out to $400 billion. Plus, the Federal Reserve has bought $1.2 trillion of mortgages so far. Uh, isn't this really a, a backdoor bailout of Wall Street banks at the taxpayer's expense? I think what it is in the, in the first instance is making sure that the housing markets of this country, which are enormously important, um, to the uh, stability of our financial system, to our broader economy, are stabilized. Um, uh, like the other efforts that the government made uh, in late 2008 and continuing on into 2009 with respect to stabilizing our financial system, this was, this was uh, not a set of things that the government wanted to do, uh, probably ever expected it would do, but um, uh, the previous administration and, and, uh, and we now have um, made the judgment that in order to protect the financial system and the economy and the country from much more catastrophic failure and pain, uh, these were necessary programs to put in place. Um, uh, it is, uh, of course, true that we will have to figure out, and as I mentioned in my, in my remarks, we are... Uh, in the process, uh, uh, sort of in the, uh, in the throes of trying to figure out what uh, this uh, system of housing finance ought to look like going forward. Critically important that we do that. Um, uh, but I think that, uh, um, you know, uh, government actors, policymakers are like most other people on the planet in a world of making choices. Uh, and here, um, as unhappy in some sense as this set of choices was, it was uh, we judged the vastly better of the choices, and we uh, continue to believe that it is having uh, important effects at uh, stabilizing our financial markets, our housing markets, uh, which still obviously are facing distress, but I think have shown um, for some time now important signs of, of stability. So... Um, you know, that's the, basic, that's the basic answer. It's been said that the next set of institutions that are too big to fail are our state and local governments, uh, with New York, California, New Jersey projecting, mm. projecting really astronomical budget deficits. So I'm curious if, what reforms you may see needed in the area of state and local government finance, and if you could also touch a little bit on sort of the pension obligations as a driver of that and whether Pension, the federal government will need to step in around pension reform as well with the obligations that the states have promised and sort of providing them some type of cover as they need to restructure these obligations. I think I'm sort of loath to get um, myself in the business of giving advice on this sort of thing to the states. I think in general, although there are a set of states that have had some real difficulty, if you look at how they're being treated by the market and, um, and you look at the you know, the cost of credit to them, and you look at spreads and so forth on their paper, they're doing okay. Um, we obviously pay some attention to this. Uh, I wouldn't expect that the federal government is um, uh, going to involve itself in this set of things uh, in the foreseeable term, but, um, uh, but uh, it's an important set of issues and one on which we'll continue to keep tabs. But I think, um, you know, given the other things on which we have principal cognizance and so forth, I let, uh, I'll sort of forego the opportunity to express a view. <laughs> Tempting as it is. Um. Arguably one of the biggest contributors to the financial markets crisis, not only of 2008, but um, the internet bubble of 2000, the current Asian currency crisis before that, and, and even the crash of 87, all, all of which happened since I gradu graduated from this fine institution was um, excessive risk-taking 
at the individual level, particularly in proprietary trading and in unregulated and less regulated businesses from insurance, investment banking, and the brokerage firms. To the best of my knowledge, the Dodd-Frank bill does not um, regulate in any way or, or even ask uh, these, or, these institutions to link compensation um, to much longer term or, or deferred type of payouts. Is there anything that the Department of Treasury or the Federal Reserve is contemplating that it can do by regulatory means that was not in the legislation? Broadly or on the comp side? Uh, particularly on the compensation. Um, you mean while we're on the topic of fraught subjects? Um, uh, um, you know, the legislation does speak to compensation in a range of ways with respect to the independence of compensation committees, with respect to say on pay uh, obligations. These are things that the SEC, uh, in the case of uh, say on pay, for example, is in the process of um, addressing by rulemaking. Uh, there's obviously been a lot of activity uh, more broadly in the in the regulatory area. The Fed, the bank regulators, uh, some international bodies, the FSB, and others, uh, taking a look at um, how compensation might be structured um, uh, to make to sort of better align it with notions of of risk. Um, the the topics obviously come up in a big way in the context of the. ESA statute and the TARP, uh, and um, you know the special master has obviously um, done a whole lot of work in that context, uh, articulating uh, some principles in that context, but that I think have some broader applicability with respect to um, structure in, in, in particular. Um, uh, and I think for the moment, that's where we are. Um, uh, I think that uh, um, uh, on the one hand, very important for firms, uh, um, especially um, uh, especially firms that have some connection with you know uh, the public fisc, um, uh, to make sure that they are uh, paying their people in ways that um, are consistent with good. Uh, notions of good understandings of uh, risk and risk management. Um, but, you know, the president has also said, and I think it's true, we're obviously living in a market economy, and um, uh, although there is an important role for the government to uh, articulate some principles in this area, and we have, um, that, uh, you know, these are, this is a free market, and, and um, uh, there's, a, you know, there's a place beyond which one doesn't want to be too prescriptive. So it's getting that balance right, um, and uh, I think for the moment that's uh, that's where we are on the broader topic of insurance and hedge funds and private equity. Sort of the um, the examples that you gave. There are a range of things that are meaningfully relevant in this act uh, um, relating to them uh, in a range of ways. You know, you call it regulation, registration, but the gaps in the sort of the broad gaps, loopholes in the overall framework for financial services and financial services regulation been um, very meaningfully uh, closed off and eliminated. And I think very importantly, uh, the government has the capacity with respect to any one of those firms, how, whatever their corporate form is, whatever their particular uh, slice of the financial services world might be, uh, if the government believes, in this case, if the, financial, the new Financial Stability Oversight Council believes that they have systemic relevance, uh, then they come under uh, the consolidated supervision of the Fed and a set of things that um, I think are uh, quite protective of uh, the kinds of risks that, that you adverted to. You, you spoke really eloquently about the reforms of the 1930s and the criticisms that were made and what the outcome was. But clearly, those reforms didn't prevent crises in the, f in the future, including the most recent one. So my question is, if you were to look at the, the Dodd-Frank Act, do you believe it will prevent future crises? And if not, what financial risks does it fail to address? And what do you plan to do about those risks? That's a good, challenging question for the last one. Um, <laughs> uh, um, 
So first, I guess I'd start by saying, um, although what you say about the sort of spate of legislative activity in the 30s is true, it is also true that for 60 or 70 years or more, that essential framework, the one that was created in that sort of couple year period in the early mid 30s, established a framework that allowed our financial services, uh, um, our financial markets and our financial services sector to um, uh, exist on a stable, strong platform in ways that allowed it to generate, you know, to intermediate an enormous amount of investment and innovation and economic growth, the likes of which the world has never seen. And it is true, of course, and we see it now, we know it empirically, that at some point uh, that extraordinary set of things that were put in place at that time um, outlive their capacity to actually protect the system. Uh, and there is a range of reasons for that. Um, and you know the literature is already big and it's getting bigger by the nanosecond as to what exactly you know the causes were and, and all of the sort of the etiology, if you will, of the crisis. Um, but it was awfully good for an awfully long time and the envy of the world and I would make the strong argument, you know, the best it's ever been. So now we need a new set of things and that's really what we've just been about trying to create in our, in the continuing process of creating. Um, you know, my crystal ball is not uh, 70 years clear. Uh, it might not be seven weeks, probably not seven days clear. Um, but, um, but I think that the goal here was to create a framework that, um, uh, that had the capacity to, um, to deal with, to bend to, to, um, uh, to be flexible to uh, a financial services um, world, a set of markets that morph at a shocking pace, uh, that are changing and innovating with lightning speed, and that create the governance structures and the authorities uh, to allow the government to do things that will substantially lessen the probability of crisis. So it's all the things I mentioned and other things as well, but the core of it I mentioned, looking at the big, most complicated firms, the kinds of firms that have the capacity to create that problems at, on that scale and treating them in a very different, more consolidated, sort of more synoptic kind of way to make sure that the basic prudential rules are a bunch more robust, that you know, buffers are higher, uh, the margin for error is extended a whole bunch, to make sure that you know, opportunities for arbitrage in the system are squeezed out, that gaps where risk started to build up, the non-bank sector being, you know, broadly speaking, kind of a classic thing, the derivatives markets, another broadly speaking big thing, um, are treated and treated seriously. Uh, but to give the government tools to adjust its approach over time as the world turns and as markets innovate and as our understanding of risk um, changes and advances. Um, and then importantly, to make sure that the government also has a set of tools on the back end so that if there is stress again, and you know, there will be stress again, um, the government has a better um, capacity to deal with it than it did over these last few years where the options were thin and they were pretty uh, suboptimal sub and, um, and, you know, uh, um, and we saw kind of, you know, what happened. So this is not meant to be a magic elixir. Um, this is meant to be um, a serious, rigorous set of rules that we think has um, uh, the fundamental basis covered, the things that not just relate to fighting the last war, which is the tendency of folks uh, in government and out of government to do, but also to create the, um, the flexibility to fight wars, uh, if I could use that metaphor again, that we can't conceive of quite yet, but that will no doubt be coming around the corner.